What a blessing it is to come together of the saints of God saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ to bow before him and worship him. We don't know the half of what that blessing is. What a wonderful thing to be able to meet together, to have the freedom in this country of ours as flawed as it is and yet still you know the song may god shed his grace on thee and he's been shedding his grace on america for over 200 years so i hope you come this morning i know i certainly am with a thankful heart to stand true to our god the lord god almighty god most high um <clears throat> Uh, good to see uh, Big Stuff here, and uh, he's been wanting to come the last three Sundays, and 
and uh, he, 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 I met him in the parking lot. Yeah, Randy, Randy. He, he calls me, it was, I'm a little small. Short stuff. Short stuff. Yeah, so he's big stuff. So I walk over to meet him in the parking lot, and he says, what are you going to tell me? i go, got to go back home. I can't come to church again today. No, no. And uh, boy, um, I don't know. See, I'm trying to remember. Did you get some good news this week? I mean, oh, boy, what's? Oh, it could be better. Yeah, I know. Come on, tell us. 50% of my cancer is gone. Yeah, if you didn't hear that, 50% of this cancer is gone. And I go down Tuesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, they're going to start pumping this new blood into my system where they send it off to have that other stuff put in. And it'll go into my system, and then uh, after that's over, we'll go into to extreme chemo and uh, some other treatments. And uh, I don't know, I've, I've been, my name's been put on a, on a book they're going to keep a tally of this whole procedure and my name's going to be at the top of it and uh, if people have questions whatever so I now that's good to be in that book but there's another book that your, your name's in it's in there too it, it's the lord's book of life in fact you get a new name written in that book that's praiseworthy too isn't it and it's good to see cindy here and uh, now you don't. We're not. Can't sing happy birthday to you every week. Now, right? okay, okay. I just didn't. I I didn't want any disappointed expectations. And um, good to see you all. And like I say, what a what a blessing. Just drink it all in. What a blessing it is. To, what am I? Yes, I'm. You know, sometimes you forget the things that are right on the top of your mind. Because, yeah, and Lyle's back with us. And uh, yeah, <laughs> what a what a blessing! And uh, yeah, keep keep prompting me, you guys, and Randy and Carol, Pat, Chuck, Chuck and Pat, and uh, and uh, John. Okay, die. any more prompts? I'm trying to see them. You know, we say God is good, but God is good. We sometimes we realize that, but and, and just and sometimes we just kind of know that, but. Sometimes it, it fills our being that God is good. You know, I've learned a thing or two over the last few weeks. I've learned that um, God can do anything he chooses to do and that no purpose of his can be thwarted. I'm learning more and more to rejoice in my sufferings. Now that's not, oh, I've got my chin, I've got you know, carpet burns on my chin. No, this is because he says rejoice. And then he says, now look what I'm going to do. I'll produce in endurance in your life. And then he said, and through that endurance, he said, I will produce character. And in that character, he said, I will give you hope that does not disappoint. But here's kind of the new that I haven't emphasized as much, and I've shared this with you guys. But in, in, in years past, as much as it hit me, it's the truth that's there, but it's just overwhelmed me now. That hope, why is that? Because the Holy Spirit of God is pouring God's infinite, eternal love into my life and yours. Now, that's pretty noteworthy, isn't it? So, it's, like, it's that farmer's insurance. You know, we know a thing or two. So, we're, we're, we're learning a thing or two. Janice could sing, I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere. Texas and Wisconsin and Arizona, and Texas again, I think. And, and uh, so anyway, so good to see you. And had a really good visit with Janice Cam this past week. You know, she, she, said, uh, she said, I miss everyone. And, uh, but Eddie, Eddie did a wonderful job on that house, the layout, and she's got you walk in the, the main floor and you go to the left and she's got a living area and a beautiful bathroom and a bedroom. And I think I'm gonna call Eddie or text him and see if he's got any more openings. I mean, this look, this was nice. Yeah. And, uh, but she was, she was doing, doing really well. But um, you know, when she gets the DVDs and, and, and loves getting that. And I'd like to say it's because of my wonderful preaching. And I think she does like that part, but I think maybe her favorite part might be seeing you guys. And uh, God allows us to do that because he's blessed us in that way with the technology. Isn't that wonderful? A um, couple program notes. Um, 
if you looked at your notes, don't faint. Much of that is FYI for your information. I think I can move right through those. Now those of you that hadn't looked, now you're going to go, oh my goodness. So don't do that. We're going to, after communion, I am going to lead us in singing the chorus and reading the verses of Oh How I Love Jesus. So um, I will be doing that from the pulpit. And, you know, I just... Um, I was on my bicycle, and that's been such a blessing, on my bicycle almost every morning, having the strength and the time, the energy to do that. And just it just came up in my heart, and I'm just going down, I can't remember what country road or the highway or where, and it just said, why not, Dave? And I just started singing. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. And you know why? Because he first loved me. Because 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. So there's a carrot out in front of you. We're going to sing that chorus together and read those just excellent verses together. Announcements, uh, tomorrow board meeting at 9, Wednesday missions committee meeting at 5 p.m., August 28th. Micah McCurry will be preaching in our morning service. And uh, Randy asked about him playing the piano. And I told him, I said, well, I tell Micah, you can't come without singing. The folks there won't, won't have it. So and he'll be singing over at the house too. Make sure you let us know if you want to be a part of Sunday dinner that day. No evening service then and Labor Day weekend. And no services will be taking part at Colchester at the community service. Any other announcements I need to bring our attention to? Yes. And they, they did figure out what happened then. That was just, that was just, it's one of those, these, one of these things, you, you, your nightmares. Yeah. Because how many times have we had the husband, wife, okay, where are you? I just, I really wish you'd answer the phone. And that's what I understand kind of was going on. And tell him, say her first name, his wife. Michaela. Michaela, and pray for Michaela yeah. and, and family. And this was... Um, Lisa's brother, correct? Yes. Yeah, and Lisa, two kids. and uh, yeah, and the two kids, just and two kids yeah, put that family up in prayer. Other prayer requests this morning. Yes. Our brother and Penny with the COVID. Thank you. There's another one I was overlooking. Yeah, Larry uh, has COVID, and he thinks Penny has it. Yeah. And as I reminded him, he's not getting any younger either. So. But we'd like to keep him around for a while. Yeah. He's been a good friend. Any others I have overlooked? Um, oh, it just, I'm hearing somebody. Nope, just talking. Okay. Uh, other prayer requests this morning? Uh, went Randy's trip, of course. And. Uh, I'm on it. Praise note. Uh, Jeff, my son, he found uh, something on his leg, mm. and he was so afraid it was malignant. But it turned out it was not. No. And Janet could probably tell you more what that word means. I, I can't even pronounce it, but it's stuff scares to death, won't it? It so. that it's got like two little walnuts that's grown together mm. on his leg. They still got to take it off. No but food. not malignant, not cancerous. So that's right. Okay. Okay. Now, you know, I'll forget something, so you all, just we together now, we'll bow our heads and we'll approach, boldly approach the throne of grace and bring these requests before our Lord. Mighty God, how we do thank you that you've moved in our hearts in such a way to come before you and worship you today. I look out here and I, I see Lyle and Lana and I thank you and praise you and Randy and, and Cindy and, and John and and, oh, I've started it now, Lord, giving names, and I might forget somebody, but Janice and, well, you know, Lord, the whole gang. What a blessing to, to see the saints of God together, bowed to worship before you for the things that you bring us through, this wonderful news on, on Randy's cancer. And uh, just your, your, your day by day, moment by moment walk with us. We, 
the, the testimony that's encouraging to me with, uh, for instance, with Lyle and, and with uh, Joyce and the, the things that she's going through. And you just hear it in their voice, Lord, a, a deep, true walk with God Almighty, salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord, and, and how we're so thankful for that because we do, we speak to those in the community and, and they've lost someone and, and they have no answers and, and such sadness and such tragedy. So we just, they need to hear this good news that you've given to us. Uh, pray we be with Randy and Kelly and they're traveling. Thank you that we see uh, John back. Thank you for bringing Chuck and Pat safely back to us and for the wonderful time that you gave them on this mini vacation and the time with family and uh, good traveling in the car. Um, Lord, I know there's something I haven't brought our attention to, but you know all of these things. And just let us express that right now just our great joy in worshiping you and our love for you and that you, Holy Spirit, would continue to capture us and move us through this entire service, how we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we're gonna we're gonna read verse four. This was pre-planned. Read with me verse four. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me, as thou didst bless the bread by Galilee. Then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Amen. Oh, send thy spirit, Lord, now unto me, that he may touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within thy word, and in thy book to revealed I see. Let's pray again. Mighty God, we ask you to help us to cast all of our cares upon you to lay every burden at your feet as you are mighty God, faithful to save the believing heart. How we thank you for the words of scripture. How we thank you for our communion account the Lord's Jesus personal message to us directing us his commandment to remember him remember who he is remember what he has done and Lord help us to not have hearts like so many of those in Galatia that had forgotten these things we thank you that about 2,000 years later, the Holy Spirit of God directs our hearts and minds to do these simple things, to take the bread and to take the cup and to do this and to remember you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you've given us that awareness that you've broke through the darkness with your piercing light and we can do something else this morning to bring you praise, glory, and honor in our obedience in these things. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen.
Rich, I seem to have a problem. I, um, our last communion time, we, uh, he, we, he uh, gave me one and not the other, so I joked with him, and so I guess he's going to show me a thing or two, right? <laughs> you know what the good thing about is that is, is I know Rich would never do that. So we're going to let him get back in here, and we're going to walk before the Lord, enter before the Lord together in this. And he held up one finger, so we'll see. We might just take this time just to, to think what the opportunity God has given us, another opportunity. How many saints over the ages, those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, have taken the bread and cup? Now, we have a lot of religious exercise during that time and millions upon millions of people doing that, but genuinely the saints of God. And we stand in that wonderful procession of the saints to take the bread, to take the cup, and to remember him. And uh, we're uh, still waiting for, he might have had to fix it up. So there we go. Uh, appreciate you so much rich so what we typically go to for our communion text for i received from the lord what i also delivered to you that the lord jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you for you for me for you do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> In the same way, also he, <clears throat> he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's another pretty wonderful thing that we could be a part of this morning. So, just pretend you're out there with me on my bicycle. Look at, turn on your sheet. And we're going to sing the chorus. And then I'd like for you to read with me the words of the verses. And then we will sing the chorus because, you know, I keep telling you I've been learning a thing or two. And one of the things I've truly, God has been impressing on me is the greater our love for Christ the greater for everything and the things of God and the more that we hate what is wrong and contrary and opposed to him. We don't necessarily have to decide to do those things. That's what he brings. He shows us the stark contrast between righteousness and evil, good and bad, God and the devil and this world system. So, join me in the chorus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. <clears throat> how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Now think through these words as we read them. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect flea. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yields sunshine all the way. It tells of one whose loving heart 
can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Cause he first loved me. Lord, thank you for bringing your love to us, making hearts of cold, cold contrary hearts, making them soft through the words of God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, loving us first, that we might know what love is and that we might love. Holy Spirit of God, as you so faithfully do, direct us in our preaching this morning as we open the word of God melt away the callousness of our hearts help us to be open and true before you to be even eager for the transforming by the renewing of our minds even eager for your correction and righteousness your instruction your rebuke your reproof that we might walk in the way of god this morning in jesus name we do pray amen as I said, I've, there's a lot in your notes, and much of that is for your information, and I'm going to do my very best to move through these things. Um, I wanted you <clears throat> to have a broad picture. So, beginning, the Apostle Paul is the preeminent voice of the gospel in the New Testament. And 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 is the most definitive and explicit statement of the gospel in the entire Bible. Preeminent means surpassing all others, having paramount rank, excelling others. That is the Apostle Paul's place as an apostle, as the main authority, as he says, the gospel he preached. Definitive means the gospel that he gives in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 is definitive. It means firm, final, and complete, not to be questioned or changed, most reliable or complete or accurate, authoritative, not able to be argued about. And explicit means, it's the explicit statement of the gospel. Explicit means stated clearly and in detail, leaving no room for confusion or doubt, fully revealed or expressed without vagueness, implication or ambiguity, leaving no question as to meaning or intent. That is how God operates. It is how he shares his gospel with us. It is definitive. It is explicit. God speaks very plainly, very clean, clearly to us. There is no confusion or vagueness in the text. Confusion and doubt are only introduced to the discussion of the gospel through the defiant human who refuses to fully submit to the explicit statement of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first important importance what I also <clears throat> received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Explicit definitive statement from God as to what the gospel is. So you may wonder, how does a false teacher get around such clear teaching? Well, two things, and you'll see these in Galatians. One, you undermine the authority of the speaker. This is why in various places in Paul's letters, he's defending his apostleship, because that's what you do. If the message sounds like you can't you can't undo the message, then you try to undermine the speaker. It happens in, in all, all kinds, in all walks of life. So you undermine the authority of the speaker. You could do that. 
you don't like what the pastor is saying, and the pastor uses a lot of Bible verses, and you can't hardly argue with that, then what do you do? You undermine the pastor of the church. Second, you move away from the clear statement of Scripture. And this is so simple, but I don't know how, how people miss it so much. You, here's the clear statement. There's no, there's no uh, statement of the gospel more plain and more clear than 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. How do people mess it up? Because you move away from the clear statement. You move away from what it says. You begin adding and subtracting. See, we, we need to understand that a false gospel is not the total abandonment of truth. Not at all. As you will see from the examples in your notes, the false gospels there contain the most important and powerful elements of the gospel. Do you follow that? Every one of the false gospels I've listed in the addendum contain very important, some of them maybe they get all the important elements of the gospel. And so people look at that and say, well, well that looks like our gospel, except what they've added or taken away. See, there's no excuse for receiving a false gospel or for tolerating false teaching immediately upon moving away from the text you've given yourself to the lie immediately and you're trapped in the web of what is more plausible more reasonable well this well this makes sense to me and it appeals to the person's pride and you know what Paul will teach us and it's an anathema to God it's calling you're calling upon yourself the divine wrath of God See, we need to, <clears throat> the word Paul uses, <clears throat> the word Paul uses in Galatians 1.7 is metastrepho, and it means to turn. See, the, the gospels that are here, and, and most of the false gospels, this isn't speaking of Hinduism, Buddhism, Muslim, that, it's this, these are the ones who say, we have the gospel. They do. They do. They have the data. They have the information turned a little bit just turned this much so it means to turn to cause to change or turn into something different assuming new characteristics we could very accurately describe what false teachers do as tweaking the gospel now it's interesting with that thought in mind it's a very good word tweak means to make usually small adjustments to improve, and this is that they made a small, they said, we just add this one thing. And, and their intent, and what did they say? We improve. Joseph Smith believes he improved the gospel. Every false teacher believes they improve the gospel. How arrogant, what blasphemy that the fallen human improved over the saving good news of our God clearly stated in Scripture. This group, the Galatians, just added one thing, circumcision. If you had looked at their gospel and Paul, they said, we just added this one thing. So first you'll see, and I work to your notes now, Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul wrote with the authority given to him by Jesus Christ and the Father. He was called to preach the gospel that was given to him by Jesus Christ. We're not going to read all these scriptures. Again, these are for your information. You'll see that in Galatians 1, 11 to 16. You can, Paul recounts his experience. You have that listing in Acts 26, 14 to 18. You have the, the 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Paul said, I didn't, I was not sent to do anything else. I was not sent to baptize. I was not sent to circumcise. I was sent to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians one twenty three. but we preach Christ crucified. And you'll hear groups say that. 
and they do that, but they but then they add this other because somebody could say if 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 you want to have your your blinders on and you say well they well they preach Christ crucified too, they preach Christ crucified plus. And it always corrupts the holy word of God. Only one gospel can save us. See the present evil age. Only one gospel can save us from that. There's a coming judgment. See, one day, human opinion, you know, if, if, you have, if we have any sense about us, human opinion needs next, means next to nothing to us anyway when it comes to spiritual matters. But one day it will mean absolutely nothing because God will bring about his judgment. And that's at the end of this age. And this age here, it's the term eon. And you'll see your note there. It denotes the world in motion in contrast with cosmos, which, though used in a variety of senses, includes the world at rest. The eon, then, refers to the world viewed from the standpoint of time and change. This, this earth history is an eon. It's coming to an end. The end will be, it speaks of here, you have several verses, judgment. It is the world of, of, or transitory era which is hastening to its close and which in spite of all its pleasures and treasures there is nothing of abiding value. Over against this present world or age, this eon, is the coming world, the glory age that we will be ushered in at the consummation of all things. And that's what we look toward, it's what is our hope, what we live in view of is the coming age of glory. We look past this eon. We believe God as when he says what is going to happen at the end of this age. <coughs> so Christ gave himself for our sins is our only hope of rescue. You've got verses there. We are to live godly lives as those who have been delivered from this present evil age and live in view of the eon to come. Titus 2.12, I will read this one. <coughs> um, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. See, that's what happens when you're living in view of the coming eon. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, the eon, waiting for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the coming judgment of this evil age. You've got excellent, excellent verses there. Our rescue is guaranteed forever because Christ is at the right hand of God. His name is above every name, not only in this age, in this eon, but every eon to come forever and ever. And those who are of this present evil age who do not believe are oblivious to the coming judgment of God. And you've got several verses there. Again, it, these, are wonder, these are wonderful, powerful verses. They're for your information. I will read the last one. The God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. If someone's looking at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, and they're saying, I don't understand that, or they're saying, well, there's got to be more. What that tells you is their, their eyes are still blinded. They're still walking in darkness. The gospel is veiled to them. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Second main point this morning, Paul expresses his astonishment at how quickly the Galatians were deserting God. And that's exactly what it's called. When they entertained the thought of another gospel, they weren't just turning their back on the gospel. Know what Paul says. You've turned your back on God. You have deserted God. You've turned away from God. Galatians 1.6. I am astonished, amazed, bewildered, befuddled. And he, he's like, how? This had been probably within 30 years, maybe within... 20 years. What did we say? Christ, take the bread and take the cup. Remember me. Do these things in remembrance of me. The only way that we remember that, the only way that we, we take communion with sincerity is the Holy Spirit of God giving us a pure, right heart. Because you can go through the motions and they probably still took communion, but they had certainly forgotten Christ and his body and his blood. And they had traded truth for the lie. And Paul says, I was astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. They deserted God 
Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. See, that's what this is. Satan's minions. You, they, take, they say your target is the gospel. That's your database. Twist it, distort it, turn it, tweak it. And then we say, and I'm amazed too with Paul, and I'll hear someone say, and they'll read somebody's statement of faith, and, well, that's what we believe. Yeah, those particular things. Again, you have the, the, the addendum. You'll see all the, the powerful, significant elements of the gospel in all four of those groups. They're there. It's not the absence, it's not the total abandonment of truth. It's the total abandonment of what God says is truth and only truth. Only Jesus Christ. Only by faith. Only by grace. No works. It's not of yourselves. And we twist and we turn it. We fall prey to the Satan. Even sometimes believers. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now here's where we need to take heed. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And then basically he's saying, I'm going to say this again because you guys really need to hear it, Galatians. And we need to hear it today in our churches today. As we have said before, so I, now I say it again. Say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Because if you preach God's word, if you preach judgment, people will say, boy, you are harsh and not half as harsh as God. And that not half as harsh as what his coming judgment will be. We don't know the half of it. His coming divine wrath. Because that's what this is. We note that Paul's emphasis, those who turn to a different gospel, desert God. But they say, but I, how many times have I heard, but they're good Christian people. Not if they're following a false gospel. They're, they're, they're good Christian people in the minds of what you have defined. Good Christian people. Of what our society has defined as good Christian people. But certainly not what the Bible speaks of. Because there's one gospel. You believe in that gospel. Now you're a good Christian people forever. Not another gospel. Only a false gospel brought about by people who fall prey to the devil's schemes and carry out the will of the devil in the name of God usually and distort the gospel of Christ and usually as is the case here through religious tradition and intimidation but we'll see later also it'll be the social societal pressures. You don't want to lose a friendship. You've known this person for such a long time. You don't want to lose standing in the community. The community can, can become uh, a holy observance. It can become, you know, if, do you love Jesus? And then you don't love the community the way that the, this world does. If you the love of the world, you don't have the love of God. Anyone who preaches a gospel contrary to the one Paul and the apostles preached is to be accursed, anathema. As again, Paul saying, now this isn't the divine wrath of God will come on you. See, John 3.36, John 3.36, if you want that reference, says the wrath of God is already abiding on this world. So that means the way that God provided us to be escape, to escape, to be rescued from this present evil age is through Christ, believing in him alone, faith alone, grace alone. You don't have that rescue. The wrath of God will remain on you. The gospel Paul preached is the only gospel and is most succinctly described in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, I read that earlier. You have that right there in front of you. I'll go through the bullet points. This is the gospel Paul preached. This is the gospel they received and in which they stand. This is the gospel by which they are being saved unless they did not truly believe. This is the gospel Paul received from Christ. Holding fast to the word, Paul preached to them meant neither adding nor taking away anything. It's always humans deciding better than God that, well, we can do, I know this person, I know this group, they're good Christian people, and, and I just can't see how that's wrong. Well, that's because you don't go, and Scripture is your authoritative, final, last, complete word. You move, see, you move away from the text. And, and then when you move away from the text, you're done until you repent. Because, see, the, we looked at last week, the 2 Timothy 2, 
224, 25. That person that's, that's uh, been captured, taken uh, prey by Satan, that you can tell them the truth all you want, but they won't hear it. They can't receive it until they come to repentance. Until they come to repentance. So, the gospel. Christ died for our sins. In accord. Hey, just read that with me, okay? Here's the gospel. That last bullet point. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the gospel. Paul would not be intimidated and leaves no doubt as to whose approval he seeks. Galatians 1.10, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul refused to be intimidated. And this was a big deal. Cephas, I said Paul was the preeminent voice, but Cephas, Peter, is who that is. He was the, he was the preeminent leader. He was the leader in the early church. <clears throat> Peter had gotten caught up in this. He had been tim intimidated because this group came down and they said, well, you just can add, <clears throat> add circumcision. After all, we, we, it's already part of our tradition. It's, it's a good thing to do. And, and, and what does it say here? Galatians 2.11, But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. We don't do a lot of that anymore, opposing those who... The, who are, are who teaching falsely because that's just it's not a nice thing it's not a nice thing to do no what we would rather do is is not have, have them face the end of this eon you know we've been studying ecclesiastes and we'll get back there next week by the way and this end of this eon everything under the sun and one day that ends you die and then comes what somebody tell me judgment. then comes a judgment so go ahead and be nice. Just, you know, don't, don't warn them of eternal judgment and damnation. Be more loving than God or these crazy people who follow him and believe you have to stay with exactly what's written in his word of truth. Paul's gospel was by faith alone, grace alone, no works. You got Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 there. Any work, <clears throat> any work. Let me say it one more time. Any work added to the gospel corrupts the gospel and it condemns the preacher. What did Paul say? Anathema, curse on that person who proclaims a corrupted gospel. Any work, circumcision, church attendance, water baptism, tithing, then the whole person is obligated to keep the whole law. Galatians 5, 2, look I, Paul, say to you, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. What's he saying? You've chosen. See, there's two systems. There's Christ, which is by faith, by grace alone. And then there's you do something to work this out. So when you say this, even one thing, I do something to work this out, then what did you say? Then, then Christ is no effect because you've rejected the Christ system. And you've embraced the human system. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Any outward show of works is only for the benefit of unscrupulous false teachers. And you know, we can even see this in evangelists, in evangelists and, and, and people making, making quote unquote decisions for the Lord, you know, raise a hand and wow, we had 20 hands raised and not really, you know, examining to see if these, these were genuine or not, but say, man, I, I preached the word of God and we had 45 people you know, come to know the Lord. And what well, did they? Did, you, did anybody follow that up? I mean, even if one of those 45 truly came to know the Lord, that'd be great. But, but why is that? What's that? It's that show. for Because you're loving yourself more than you're loving those people. You're loving yourself more than you're loving God. Because if you love God, you love his way. You're concerned about the things of God. You're willing, in fact, Christ says, to give up everything up to and including our lives. So we have four examples in our addendum. And I'm going to let you, again, for your information, we're, we're doing really well time-wise. I've also put in some excerpts in here. Now, let, I've given you the links. These are their words. 
I have organized some of them with bullet points. I have not changed one word. So don't you dare say that I'm saying what they're saying. This is what they're saying. You know, it's interesting. I've been, since I've been here going on 10 years now, I've been accused of lying and slander. But you know what never happens? Never happens, because I, you know, there's a lot, I write a lot of stuff, don't I? And so you would think if I was lying and slandering, somebody could go, go to this and say, right here, this is where, this is where you're not telling the truth. This is where you're slandering. Never has happened. Why? Because they're just, they're angry and they're attacking and they fall and pray to Satan. You're not interested in establishing the truth. You're not interested in the truth at all. The Mormon gospel. Now I want you to look. Important elements. What? Their very first one, what did they say? Somebody tell me. Wow, you'll have somebody, I'll have somebody and I'll look at that. Wow, they believe in faith in Jesus Christ. That's not so much different than ours, is it? Well, no, not that part. Come on, folks. How, how, do, we, how do we walk in wisdom? We walk in the Word of God. We walk in the Word of God as led by the Holy Spirit of God. When we, when, we, when we go that route, we're just wanting to deflect criticism. We're wanting to not enter the battle, even though God calls us to. And we're leaving the gospel confused and there's people that that you know and they think they believe the gospel and they're on their way to hell because it's not the gospel at all it's some human contrived notion repentance well we re come on we believe in repentance right we don't believe well we do live, believe in laying on hands in in some degree not exactly like they do but but what do i have highlighted baptism then you have some other statements roman catholic gospel Again, they've, there's statements, there's links, you can go right to it, see if I'm lying and slandering, again, I'm not, but help yourself. Statement they make, faith alone will not save a person, that's their statement. Remember, all, everything in this addendum is, are their statements. This is Roman Catholic statement. So what's their first in the bullet points? Believe in God, put faith in Jesus, repent of sins. Because they, wow, why are we upset with the Roman Catholics? They, they, they've got the gospel too, don't they? Well, except for they added something, didn't they? What'd they add? Baptism, didn't they? So, you, there's more comment there. That's theirs. That's not mine. This is this person writing. Christian Restoration Movement. Well, they have what you must do to become a Christian. They also have what you must do to remain a Christian. So, first, to become a Christian, you believe, repent of sin, confess Christ. <coughs> I'm right there with them on that, aren't you? But what happened is, uh, is number four in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4? Not there, is it? They've added it. Why did they add it? Because they knew better. They knew better. They tweaked it. They improved it. And then they have what you must do to remain a Christian. And I, I told you the person I talked to, one, he was a leader in the Christian church and I had a good conversation with him. We didn't agree on things, but he's the one that he said two things. He, he said one, he said, yes, well, you have your convictions. I have my convictions. God's a God of grace and it'll all work out in the end. No, at the end of the age, at the end of the eon, you'll, you will be rescued from the end of the age, from the judgment at the end of the eon, only through faith alone in Jesus Christ. They weren't just convictions. And then the other thing he said, he volunteered this. And he said, and don't forget, you've got to hang on to it. Well, we're going to see a little bit later, Galatians 2, 20 and 21. No, we don't hang on to it. Why do we endure? Because Christ lives in us the hope of glory. So, and, uh, we have, so then we have, so we see the common uh, baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Nope. So then we have a missionary answers the questions. And these questions were, what is the gospel? How is a person saved? In short, the gospel is Jesus and him crucified and resurrected. See, important elements. Be saved, you must believe in Jesus. Well, very important. And it's the Son of God and sacrifice for our sins. Right on with all of that. Number three, must repent, turn away from our sins. What's number four again? Oh, well, they've added something, haven't they? See, that's not in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 either, is it? And you say, well... <coughs> You, 
you know, maybe they need to clarify. They were given an opportunity to, to clarify. This is their clarification. And they gave five verses. And four of them refer to baptism. What's that tell you? All the verses. I have close to 50 verses that I've, and it's just, and it's just, and there's other verses too that speak of believing for salvation. But these are just the most plain, direct ones, close to 50 verses. Didn't use any of those. Instead referred to baptism. Hanging onto something, and you've got, you've got all of that. So, conclusion. How about that? Conclusion. What should be our attitude toward false gospels and those who promote them? What should be our attitude toward false gospels and those who promote them? And you have all of this except for one or two comments, and I will try to remember to tell you. Those who know the Lord love the Lord our God above everything else. And I forgot that first because those who know the Lord love the Lord above everything else, love him so much that, that yeah, we, I, we want a good reputation in the community but it's not going to be paramount. We, we don't want just to be intentionally antagonistic to whatever group it is. But I love God first. And so here it just says it, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. See also Matthew 22, 37, Luke 10, 27. When we look at someone's false gospel and we do this, or we turn a blind eye, you're not loving God. No, you might love God, you might be a believer, but at that moment, you're, you're disappointing him. You're, you're shaming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second, those who know the Lord will remain faithful to him because Christ lives in us. And... Uh, <clears throat> Just further insight for me, maybe you guys have known this for years, but it just the light bulb went on. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You remember I told you the comment of the man? And uh, he said, but remember, you got to hang on to it. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> it's the opposite. Go to John 10.28, 29. He's hanging on to you. But this verse is so clear and so powerful. It is no longer I who live. Do we still deal with this body of sin? I mentioned to you John MacArthur's comment. Someone, he said, asked him, what do you look forward to most in heaven? He said, being done with this body of sin. Amen. Got my hand up. Man. And But you know what? We, but then we don't say... Oh, you know, I must have, you know, God, you know, how could he say? Because his grace, his mercy, his love is actually our, our sinfulness shows us this effort. His, it's got to be all God in saving us. And in fact, as we grow in him, he shows us more and more. And we just sit back in wonder at, oh, how wonderful, oh, how marvelous is my Savior's love for me because one day oh boy we struggle I could tell you stories but you wouldn't even if I started telling you stories you wouldn't even have me back next Sunday and if you start telling each other stories we might sit farther apart next week but God knows that all isn't it wonderful the deepest darkest most sinful thoughts we have covered by the blood of Jesus Christ our Savior he's our only rescue and we will be rescued. We will be rescued because God says that. Don't change that around either. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Say that, for me. Say that with for you. For me. For you. You've trusted in him. For you. For me. He, that is our Savior. Those who love the Lord should neither help the wicked nor love those who hate the Lord. And let me just get to the verse and I'll have a comment. Second Chronicles 19.2. Well, you've got them. 
But Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, who was a somewhat godly king, but he went and he had been hanging out with Ahab, and he said, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. And he was disciplined at the end of his life. Psalm 5, verse 4, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. There's no bigger lie than a false gospel. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. If we help the wicked, and you don't have this in your notes, well, you have part of it, maybe. If we help the wicked by turning a blind eye to their sinful actions, then we are both complicit and culpable in their sinful actions. What do I mean? Condoning and supporting any person or group who holds to a false gospel, please hear me, condoning and supporting any person or group who holds to a false gospel is helping the wicked. Complicit means involved with others in an illegal activity. It's against God or wrongdoing involved in something bad that happens. And there's nothing more bad than supporting someone who's giving out a false gospel, adding to corrupting the blessed gospel of God. Culpable, you're deserving of blame, deserving to be blamed, or considered responsible for something bad. The churches, five out of the seven churches, you know, Paul wrote the letters in most of the New Testament, but the last five letters written to churches are in Revelation in chapters two and three, and they're written by Christ himself and he sent them by messenger. Already, just by the end of the first century, about 70 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, those churches were so far off, five of them were standing in condemnation before the Lord. He said, I've tolerated this, and the biggest ones were false teachers and false teaching. They were people in that group, people who were their peers, people who were in the community, and they were tolerating it, and God said, enough's enough. You change it, or I will judge you. We act in love. It says, well, what we, we do act in love toward them in personal matters. So if you have a false teacher who lives across the street from you and their car won't start or they've been sick you might take them chicken noodle soup you might jump their car for them but in matters as far as supporting condoning their work it is in opposition to god and we will be complicit and culpable next those who love the lord should hate evil in every false way now i've got to have some pretty good verses here because you might say now wait a minute because we, you know, don't we, we just love to go for all the love verses. And, and that's great because they're just as true and genuine. But we, we like to avoid some things because it, it kind of helps us. Maybe we're escaping some of our responsibility. But those who love the Lord should hate evil in every false way. Psalm 97.10. Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. And again, is there anything more evil than a false gospel? I don't think so. Psalm 101, verse 3, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Psalm 119, 104, through your precepts I get understanding. <coughs> Therefore, I hate every false way. You know what? If you don't hate these false ways that we've been talking about, you know what that shows? You're not in the Word of God. And if you are in the Word of God, you don't understand the Word of God. Listen to it again. Through your precepts, the word of God, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Psalm 119, 113. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. Can you see the contrast again? And the sec next verse, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Your, I don't deviate from your word. I don't Leave the word when it's convenient for me. I hope in your word. Psalm 119, 128. Therefore consider, I consider all your precepts to be right. Again, agreement with God, the word of God. And what does it say? I hate every false way. Psalm 119, 163. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. If you don't hate and abhor 
falsehood, I think we can make a case that you don't love God's word and you don't love God at least as you should. Amos 5.15, hate evil and love good. Those who love the Lord must warn the wicked away from the wide road of destruction. Quit patting them on the back and telling them they're okay. And that, yeah, we agree. You know, I've, I have, I've received criticism because someone saying, well, you know, you should associate with this group because of the things we have in common. What have we learned today? That we, I have things in common with the Mormons, the Jehovah's, well, we didn't count the Jehovah's Witnesses. We didn't get that far, but it would be true for them. The Roman Catholics, Christian Restoration Movement, all of those false gospels. So, yeah, there's certainly things in common. Such foolishness. And what, why is that? Because as soon as you leave what God says, the definitive, explicit teaching of Scripture, the moment, the second you step away, you, you accept, you take the lie, you trade truth for a lie. So enter by the narrow gate. The gate is wide, the way is easy, that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. See, there's a lot of people going to church at wide road theology. If you truly love them, you're going to risk losing a friend or a neighbor or a family member and say, the end of this eon, the end of this eon, there's one rescue. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. There's one rescue. You'll get all kinds of promises. You'll hear all kinds of things on that wide road. But at the end of that road is destruction. The end of this eon, the end of this age is judgment. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. See, these people, they're, they're convinced by the lie. Lord, Lord. On 20, verse 22, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. Well, they, they say, Lord, Lord. They must know the Lord, right? What does Jesus tell them in verse 23? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Next, those who love the Lord should work to undermine the claim of those who deceitfully claim commonality of belief and service with us. And this is another one of these things. You just, you're just, just amazed at, at times what, what people want you to accept. They want you to accept, well, their version of the gospel, and then they think it's your version of the gospel, and that you should let bygones be bygones, just, you know, let, let give peace a chance, you know, kind of. But no, Paul says here very directly, Corinthians 11, 12, and what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine. Now, this is not just to undermine the work that they're doing, but he said to undermine the claim. You say you have the same gospel. Paul said, I will continue to do this. I will work to undermine your claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. And you can face much anger and hatred and say, why are you being so stubborn? Look, look at these, it's like this is it, it's not just, it's like isn't that taking it a little bit too far? Well, the scripture says no. The scripture says, and this is back again, do you love the Lord? Is he first and foremost in everything? Is he above your reputation in the community? Is he above the thoughts of your co-workers, your family? Is he everything? And we will work to undermine that. Seven, those who love the Lord must hold firm to the gospel. Philippians 1.27 Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. One gospel. You know what, Faith Fellowship Church of Tennessee, Illinois? We're a little bitty old church, aren't we? Yeah, boy, you're a little bitty old church. But you know what? We have the opportunity to stand strong, and true, it was mentioned to me, I'll be strong in the Lord. Yeah, I, I love that song too. And we've sang the last couple of weeks. We might be, maybe should have done that again this week too. But um, don't overlook the opportunity God has given us. Don't overlook the opportunity he's given us to be hand in hand, loving him, loyal to the truth, holding fast the firm foundation of the faith. 
whether there's three of us or 300 of us. What a treasure you are, those of you who have faithful hearts, are receptive to the word of God. I might commend you, but you just wait until that day when Jesus Christ, when God the Father says, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Mighty one, how we thank you, how we love you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We will close and stand and sing the solid rock, and we'll repeat the chorus after the last verse. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds on Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my Stay. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And we'll repeat. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other